All of that information goes from one cell to another when it divides and divides and divides, and that information is passed down. How do you come up with that? Hola a todos, bienvenidos a God Science. Mi nombre es Cristian Jiménez. En esta ocasión tenemos un tema fascinante y gran relevancia para todos ustedes. Vamos a presentar un debate reciente que tuvo lugar en la prestigiosa Universidad de Harvard, donde dos científicos destacados, el Dr. James Tour y el Dr. Lee Cronin, intercambiaron ideas sobre un tema que a todos nos debe interesar, y este es el origen de la vida. El origen de la vida, como ustedes saben, no solamente es un tema crucial en la comunidad científica, sino también que genera un intenso debate en la comunidad religiosa. Así que esta conversación trasciende los laboratorios, las aulas académicas y toca sin duda las fibras más profundas de cada una de las personas, de sus creencias y el entendimiento que tienen sobre el mundo. La cosmovisión ateísta, por otra parte, a menudo sostiene que el origen de la vida ha sido explicado a través de la biogénesis o generación espontánea un concepto muy popularizado en la sociedad y que constantemente se usa como argumento para refutar la idea de la existencia de un creador o de Dios. Este famoso experimento conocido como la sopa primordial es un fenómeno que en años recientes el Dr. James Tour, quien es reconocido como uno de los 10 químicos más destacados del mundo y que tiene sin fin de numerosas publicaciones, además de contribuir en diferentes campos de la ciencia como nanotecnología y medicina, en estos últimos años se ha encargado de mostrar científicamente la falsedad del modelo de la sopa primordial y la experimentación de Miller Urey. Así que en este primer video vamos a presentar la perspectiva del Dr. James Tour, quien aborda los desafíos químicos para explicar el origen de la vida, incluyendo el factor tiempo, la especificidad de la información genética, las condiciones naturales necesarias para originar el primer microorganismo y las improbabilidades matemáticas de que una molécula se ensamble sin una guía. Así que en nuestro próximo video exploraremos las ideas del Dr. Cronin y una sesión de preguntas y respuestas que tuvieron a cabo en este evento. Esperamos que disfruten de esta inmersión en uno de los debates quizá más apasionantes de nuestro tiempo. No olviden suscribirse, activar las notificaciones, dejarnos sus comentarios, compartirlo con los demás conocidos. Y bueno, aquellos que aprecian nuestro trabajo encontrarán detalles con más información en la descripción de este video. Gracias por estar con nosotros y nos vemos hasta la próxima. Let me give you a few definitions. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. To construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the condition of the Earth about four billion years ago. Not my definition. This is from uh, Merriam-Webster. Prebiotically relevant means that we are restricted to materials and procedures and conditions that might have been available on an early Earth. Nobody was present when life first began. So, so we really will we'll never really know the answer to this. But that's not what we're seeking. What we are seeking is an experimentally verifiable hypothesis as to how life might have originated. Textbook characteristics of life are responsiveness to the environment, growth and change, ability to reproduce, have a metabolism and breathe, maintain homeostasis, being made of cells, passing on traits to offspring. Homeostasis is a steady internal physical and chemical condition. Professor Cronin, who's here today, agrees with me. He said, I'd like to ask you all a question, which is, what is the most basic unit of matter that can undergo Darwinian evolution that you know of? And I suppose it won't be much of a surprise to see that it's a cell. He further said, so what are the requirements of our living system? We need genetic code, we need mating, we need metabolism, we need adaptation, we need homeostasis. So Lee and I are in agreement here. <clears throat> I am not speaking of a god of the gaps. I think that we will one day find out uh, uh, how life began. But I don't think we are anywhere close, nowhere close. And how can I say this? It's because as we track the complexity of a cell and how close we are being able to reproduce this, build a cell, uh, uh, even mimicking what's here, What happens is every year the cell gets further away from us because its complexity increases with time. Not that it has evolved, but that we realize more about the cell and its complexity. So it moves way out here every year and we might move a nanometer closer and it's moving at a much further rate. That's how you can track that we're nowhere close to solving this. Chemistry is the language of living systems. We are not built out of silicon. We are not built out of transistors. We're not built out of carbon-carbon composite materials. We are built out of molecules. It is very hard to build out of molecules. There is a reason why that we don't, we don't build our robots 
out of molecules because we don't know how to do it. There's a reason why we use cameras that have lenses uh, that, are, that are made out of glass and silicon rather than, than chemicals because it's very hard to, to do this, even though we have ubiquitous examples around us in one another. You, you have to have the polysaccharides, polypeptides, polynucleotides, and lipids. These are the four classes of compounds, and you have to have the monomers that make them up. That's the, the language of living systems. But molecules don't care about life. Molecules have never been known to move toward life, ever. They don't do that unless there's a biological entity like a person pushing them along to try to do this, and still even then we've not hit it. <clears throat> There are three basic approaches to discussing origin of life, in my opinion. This is my opinion. We force reaction chemistry toward life, and it's not working. Professors Eschenmoser, Sostek, Benner, Sutherland, Krishnamurthy, and many others, including the older work of Professor Cronin, have been trying to do this. Or you avoid reaction chemistry because they realize it's not moving toward life, and more re this seems to me to be more recent work of Professor Cronin, but he'll speak for himself in a moment. I suggest that we do not yet sufficiently understand reaction chemistry to see its projection toward life. There are enormous scientific mysteries yet to unfold. They may be 100 years, 200 years away, but we still have much more to learn about reaction chemistry before we can st start seeing molecules move toward life. Professor Cronin's older work, he tried to make oligopeptides by some prebiotic-like root. It was a bunch of garbage. There was nonsense there. And, and uh, uh, same thing with saccharides, because this is hard. You try to make these sugars. We made billions of compounds. It's very hard to do this. You try to push molecules toward life. They don't want to go. They don't know to move toward life. They have no brain. They don't want to evolve toward life. There's no impetus to do this. Professor Cronin's newer approach to describing the origin of life, he avoids the use of chemical structures and chemical reactions. The language, he avoids the language of chemistry. That is because, to date, prebiotic reaction chemistry fights against the path that moves toward life. And I think he's seeing it. And I think Professor Cronin is more and more coming around to my position, and we'll see that. Professor Cronin now speaks of the general primordial soup model, saying it's a good model, with no rationale for what makes it good and what chemistry is involved. I don't know if you know the primordial soup model where you have a pond, and in that pond are some molecules. Lightning strikes, molecules form higher order structures. Those form a cell, and those cells now form higher order structures, and you get creatures living in the pond. And then those creatures evolve, and they come out of the pond. That's the primordial soup model. You know where that came from? You think that came from Miller-Urey? No. You think that came from Darwin? No. That came from the Babylonians. And out of that pond where life came from came their gods as well. You want to take those? It's nonsense. He'll speak about bubbles. He'll speak about salad dressing. Lee Cronin has said the most important thing he does in his lab is salad dressing. He'll talk about flipping coins, playing cards, royal flushes, the birth of stars and planets, anything but specifics about re reaction chemistry, because reaction chemistry is really hard to push in this direction. <clears throat> has the public been misled on the origin of life claims? Well, one third of the public, and this is 80% of this public had a college education, some level of high college education, uh, uh, college degree. One third of the general public thinks that scientists have me made frogs in their lab just by putting molecules together and built frogs. Two thirds of the general public think that, that scientists have made bacteria in their lab, a bacterium. Both of those are false, in case you didn't know. Well, because there's mixed messaging from origin of life researchers. Jack Sostek, who many of you know, Professor Sostek, he said in 2014, told a Search for Life gathering of 50 on Saturday afternoon in New York that he expected to make life in the lab in three to five years and more likely within three years. That was in 2014. How's it going, Jack? I mean, it's a, it's a rough thing. It's hard to do it. He never succeeded. Uh, uh, Dimitar Seselov, again, another Harvard professor, said that he thinks it'll take five years and not three. That was in 2014. Professor Sostek then said in the University of Chicago in 2021, he said, we've not made the RNA, he, he, he said this, what's in italics here, but it's basically, he's not even made the RNA yet in a prebiotically relevant manner. It hydrolyzes too rapidly. That's the bottom line. That's the truth. Why does he tell the experts this and the general public something else? <clears throat> Steve Benner, former Harvard professor and now director of Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, said to a YouTuber in 2021, I suppose most of the many of the big paradoxes in origin of life have been solved. Yet, 
uh, in a professional meeting in 2019, he said, chemistry is actually hard to get to work. The molecules precipitate, the molecules hydrolyze, the molecules decompose, and so it's very much a constraint that you have to deal with. It's one goddamn problem after another. That's the truth. <clears throat> Professor Cronin, in a TED talk in 2011, said, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes or so is tell you about an idea of how we're going to make matter come alive. After the talk, Chris Anderson said, just a quick question on timeline. When uh, you believe you're going to be successful in this, when? Lee Cronin, hopefully within the next two years. That was in 2011. So, so we're about 10 years overdue, and maybe Lee is going to tell us about this life today. Uh, is it any wonder that the public has been misled on the current state of origin of life proposals? Who, perchance, might have misled them? <clears throat> What's the real state of the origin of life research? Here's the underlying theme of what you're going to see. Prebiotic chemistry, as we know it, does not move toward life. Nobody has shown the method to make these enantiopure molecules. You need carbohydrates, amino acids, nucleotides, lipids, these four classes of compounds. Nobody has ever made these compounds with the, the absolute stereochemical purity that's needed using prebiotic chemistry. Never been done. Nobody has ever shown that the mixtures found in meteorites or interstellar space could be useful for synthesis because you might have 1% of the mixture being the compound you want and 99% other things. For those of you who are synthetic chemists here, you can't do chemistry like that without enzymes. It doesn't work. Even, even John Sutherland, a big origin of life researcher, says, yeah, these meteorites don't deliver anything that, that uh, is useful because you need more constrained chemistry. Nobody has solved the mass transfer problem. This is a big problem. How much material do you need to go from A all the way to Z, the cell? How much material? You go through a synthesis, you run out of material. You've got to go back and make more starting material. You've been going along now 400 million years making stuff, now you've run out of material. Well, go back and make more in the beginning. Uh, I can't go back because I never kept a laboratory notebook. I'm just a dumb early earth. How do you go back? How do you do this? Nobody knows how to solve this problem. <clears throat> Nobody has shown the prebiotic route to polymerization. You can't hook the, 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 the uh, sugars together to make carbohydrates. You can't make polypeptides because of the side chain problem, and you can't make the polynucleic acids because of the 2,5 linkage and the branching problem. Nobody's made the polymeric st systems that compose us in a prebiotic, uh, prebiotic, prebiotic route. The carbohydrate, just think of it, six, six glucose molecules. Six glucose mo molecules. How can you hook them together? A, 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 for example. No. You can hook them together in over one trillion ways, because there's all these different tentacles of how they can hook up. Over one trillion ways to hook up just six glucose molecules. They have open form, closed form, they have the anomeric system, and so <clears throat> we don't know how to do this. You get the wrong polymeric structure, the cell will never get a chance to live. Every disease has a carbohydrate problem associated with it. Nobody has solved the polymer stability problem when dealing with the single molecules. Time is enemy number one, and Martin Nowak helped me calculate this on the back of a, of a menu about a year ago. And uh, uh, so, so if you have a mole of RNA, it has a half-life, say, of 100 days, which is pretty gracious to give it. That's 2,400 hours in, room, at wa in water at room temperature. What if you have one RNA that just happened to form, just happened to be formed to be just right? How long would you have to use that? That's 2,400 divided by 600 because it's 600 mer. That's four hours. You have four hours. So if, if the right molecule happened to form and to polymerize, you'd have to have very pure monomer or else you could never get a 600 mer. And now all of a sudden, all the excess materials have to come out and you have to get all 20 amino acids diffuse in from where? We don't know. It's an early earth. It's a puddle someplace. All the, and, and they have to diffuse in, in, in high purity. You have four hours. You can't even do that in a laboratory. How's that happen on an early earth? Nobody knows. When you're dealing with one molecule, stability is a huge problem. You say a peptide lasts longer. You will last 13 days if you have a 200 mer peptide. And nobody has solved the problem with this, 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 this functional group side chain. This kills off all polymerizations of, of uh, amino acids to make polypeptides. Nobody solved that. Nobody has solved the code problem. What's the genetic code? How do you come up with the code for life? You have to have a prescribed code to orient all these models. Nobody knows where that comes from. Lee will agree. He's talked about this. You, what's the code? Where does that come from? Nobody has shown that you can deal with, with a, a, a low 
enantiomeric excess molecules and that somehow evolution they purified. No, because we know from a new phenomenon that's only about 20 or 25 years old, chiral induced spin cell activity. This is one of those mysteries that pops up, only been known for 20, 25 years. We used to think enzymes are all hand in glove, it's steric effects that, that dominate this. That's only half the story. The other half is that every chiral environment acts as a spin valve and selects the spin. And that's why in, in nature, you can have two hydroxyl radicals can come together to form hydrogen peroxide or they can go to form oxygen plus two protons because they're going down a chiral environment. We never knew this. There's many other mysteries that we're going to have to solve before we can get this thing solved. Nobody's explained the requisite protein folding. You've heard about protein folding. How does a protein fold properly without other proteins working on them that, that are these foldamer proteins acting on them? Just even a hundred residue protein has 10 to the 95 possible conformations. If you're over 10 to the 40th, there's not enough time in the universe anymore. So that's the Leventhal 1.0. Leventhal 2.0 is a problem where you have what's called the interactomes. This is the non-covalent, just the association interactions between molecules in a cell. Information travels down that through electrostatic potentials. The estimate for a single yeast cell of just the protein-protein interactions, not protein DNA, not protein RNA, just protein-protein, is 10 to the 79 billion. This is a crazy, crazy big number, totally inaccessible. In a million universes, it's inaccessible. All of that information goes from one cell to another when it divides and divides and divides, and that information is passed down. How do you come up with that? We don't know. Nobody has ever made any of the higher order structures needed for the simplest cell. They say, oh, cells were really simple back then, really simple. How simple were they? Well, biophysicists have calculated this, of the minimal complexity you could have in an in a initial cell. You had to have DNA replication repair restriction, a basic transcription machine, and all of these things. And the cell wouldn't be able to make its own any of its amino acids, you need 20 amino acids coming in exogenously. You know how many of these origin of life researchers have made in a prebiotic fashion? Zero, none. Nobody's ever made any of them. How close could we be? Nobody's ever come close to synthesizing or even suggesting how to synthesize the simplest of cells in a modern laboratory, let alone in a puddle. You can't do it in your modern lab. So how did it happen in 100 million years, which is from the cooling of the earth after the late heavy bombardment to where we see life? Or even if you, you can take any chemist, any biologist, anybody, and say, okay, we just deconstructed a cell. We have a bottle of each one of the components of the cell. Here's the polymer, so you already have the code. Can you put this thing back together in a cell for me, please, huh? No, you can't. Nobody knows how to do this. And you peg them down and you say, can you do this? They won't answer you. They won't answer you. And remember, no answer is an answer in itself. I put before 10 researchers, these 10 researchers, Lee Cronin being one of them, I said, could you, could you just solve these five? I put before you just five, just make a polypeptide, not even a polypeptide, make a dipeptide, just to hook two peptides together, make DK in 90% yield in prebiotic fashion. Make a polynucleotide, make a polysaccharide, just two glucoses hooked together with the right chemistry for me. What's the origin of specified information and could you assemble a cell? You answer any one of those five, I will shut up for the rest of my life concerning origin of life and the problems with it. I'll leave you guys alone. I send it to them, I said, you got 60 days to solve this, just solve one of them and I will shut up. None of them sent me anything except Lee, and I'll show you what he sent me. Steve Benner said, oh, I could solve that in an hour. I said, why don't you come to Harvard? Wait, you, you, and every one of these guys was invited here to this event to speak. None of them took it except Lee Cronin. Steve Benner said, no, no, I, I, I don't have time for that. I said, Lee, I will fly to your institute in Florida. You come and tell me. He said, ah, uh, my health and my time won't permit it. I'm flying to you. Uh, so Lee Cronin wrote to me, he says, hi, Jim, I don't agree with the questions. The emergence of life goes way beyond these narrow questions. I don't agree with the questions. Well, you, you, you just had a paper I showed on peptide synthesis. You just had a paper on sugars. How could, how could questions one and three be irrelevant? I mean, you have papers on that. And then, and then, uh, then he addresses questions four and five, information and cell. So he goes on Lex Fridman's uh, podcast. And I want you, want you to listen to this because Lee sent out a tweet that says, origin of life research is a scam. Lee, our next speaker, sent this out. And here's what he says when Lex asks him about this. He says, the scam is, if we just make RNA, we've got this. Let's now make another molecule and another molecule. How many molecules are going to be enough? I mean, Lee is sounding like me. I mean, he's complaining about this origin of life research. 
And go back to Craig Venter when he said, I've invented life. Not quite. He facsimiled a genome from an entity and made it in the lab, but he didn't make a cell. He had to go back and take an existing cell that had a causal chain all the way back to LUCA, which is the, which the first universal common ancestor cell. I, I, I think Lee has been born again. He's just talking, just like me. I mean, the, all these problems, but it's remarkable that he could not make a cell from scratch. And even today, synthetic biologists cannot make a cell from scratch because there's some contingent information embodied outside the genome of the cell. So there's lots of layers to the scan. So Lee and I are in, in, in coming in great agreement. Lee came up with a paper he just published. This is one, of, this is one distributed to you in the journal Nature. Assembly theory explains and quantifies selection and evolution. And it got a lot of press, groundbreaking news, theory of everything unites physics and evolution. Assembly theory, bridging physics and biology to decode evolution and complexity. Wow. Well, then other articles are now coming out. This one written by, by uh, um, evolutionary biologist, a new theory linking evolution and physics has scientists baffled. But is it solving a problem that doesn't exist? One person wrote, uh, and after multiple reads, I still have absolutely no idea what this paper is doing. <laughs> Another wrote, I read the paper and I feel more confused. I think reading that paper has made me forget my own name. <laughs> Professor Cronin has said that Jim Tour clearly, quote, clearly doesn't understand information. I confess, I'm not an informatician. But Hector Zanil is. So Hector Zanil is at both at Oxford in the Alan Turing Institute and at Cambridge. And he wrote the eight fallacies of assembly theory. Just a few quotes. These authors only a few months ago announced that they had achieved the breakthrough of making time physical using assembly theory, a claim that nobody could understand. Now they claim the same theory can explain selection and evolution, unifying biology and physics, and explains all of life. Assembly theory is a weaker version of one of the simplest algorithms known in computer science, Huffman's coding scheme, and counts for repetitions and strings of data, a form of trivial version of Shannon entropy, though unlike assembly theory, Huffman actually counts correctly. The senior authors of assembly theory claim that they are persuading NASA to incorporate their algorithm in its program to detect alien life. If it cannot pass the basic tests on Earth or on paper with their theory indicating BEER, B-E-E-R, as the greatest life form on Earth, it makes little sense to deploy it elsewhere. Professor Lee Cronin, he's abandoning, in my view, I don't understand the information, but I do understand chemistry. He draws this picture. There's no idea of how these molecules hook together. The free energy is positive on these couplings by 8 to 15 kilojoules per mole. And how do you deal with side chain reactivity? You see these lines. I don't understand the chemistry. Now he abandons chemistry. He shows these little stick figures. Is this a carbon oxygen bond, carbon nitrogen? What's the chemistry? There's chemistry behind this. You can't abandon chemistry. So I predict that Lee Cronin, a synthetic chemist, will not discuss anything tonight about chemical reactions leading to life's origin. I predict Lee Cronin will remain silent on polypeptides, polynucleotides, polysaccharides, these three key polymers that build us, and cell assembly, resorting to calling those narrow questions and not worth even addressing. Most importantly, will you, the audience, leave tonight understanding anything more about life's origin based on what Professor Cronin says? And so I'm just wrapping this up here. Stop the overambitious projections regarding the state of the field. Don't abandon the basic chemical reactions and concede that we're not yet sufficiently understanding chemical reactions to project them toward life. There's enormous m more that we have to, to, to understand. To close on a congenial note, I agree with <laughs> Professor Cronin. <laughs> I agree with Professor Cronin, origin of life research is a scam. Thank you. Well, Lee Cronin is a pre uh, professor of chemistry from the University of Glasgow, who's in town for a chemistry thing. <laughs> And Lee, we really welcome you. Please, uh, let's have a hand for Lee Cronin.